we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. Jonathan Gettleman and Elizabeth Caballero, partners at Caballero and Gettleman Law, live and practice the words that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. so eloquently stated that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. Since 2002, Jonathan and Elizabeth have fought to free Frederick Burton, an innocent man who remains wrongfully incarcerated in a Pennsylvania prison for the last 48 years. His wrongful conviction by the original 1970s Philadelphia prosecutor's office, headed up by then District Attorney Arlen Specter and later U.S. Senator from Pennsylvania, suppressed exculpatory and relevant evidence that would have exonerated Mr. Burton. Multiple ADAs have actively suppressed Burton's relevant and clearly exculpatory immunity evidence for 48 years, and the corruption in the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office has been systemic until the election of the new District Attorney, Larry Krasner. Jonathan Gettleman and Elizabeth Caballero now have that relevant evidence, but are prevented by certain personnel in the Philadelphia DA's office to obtain a fair review of the merits of constitutional issues clearly presented by the suppressed documents. These same individuals are preventing the new district attorney, Larry Krasner, a staunch advocate for justice, having spent the past 25 years as a civil rights attorney and a public defender from reviewing Frederick Burton's case. Civil rights activist, pastor, and Harvard Law School's writer in residence at the Fair Punishment Project, Sean King, calls America's new district attorneys like Larry Krasner, the gatekeepers of America's justice system. Here's what Jonathan and Elizabeth want to tell Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner and America about Frederick Burton's case. What I would like to tell Mr. Krasner is that I believe in this case with my entire being. I want to tell Larry Krasner of the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office to do the right thing and to not oppose our petition to release an innocent man, Mr. Burton. He's the one that released these documents this past June that allow us to get Mr. Burton out of prison. And yet his office, whether under his direct or indirect guidance, is still attempting to prohibit the courts from looking at the evidence and evaluating its merits. Well, it has been the historical practice of the office to not only um, hide and bury um, critical exculpatory information uh, to Mr. Burton's case, but now that has changed and it is time to provide meaningful review for Mr. Burton to provide him with a fair process. And if he would just look at the evidence, it is indisputable at this point that Mr. Burton did not get a fair trial. The petition that we currently have in court is being reviewed and we have an evidentiary hearing, but the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office is opposing the judge's review of all the facts of Mr. Burton's case. What we want is for Mr. Krasner's office to not oppose the review and to provide Mr. Burton with a fair process. And we need him to remember what it was like to be on our side of the fence, knowing that his client was innocent, facing an establishment that just would not believe it. 
Here's also what Eleanor Childs and Carol Miniker also want to tell Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner and America about Frederick Burton's case. I'm here today to ask Larry Krasner as a new person in the DA's office in Philadelphia to look into this case of Frederick Burton. From what I know about Larry Krasner, who's the new district attorney in Philadelphia, this is the kind of case that he should personally pay attention to and not delegate to someone else on his staff. I think that's the only way we will see justice done. I think it's important that all of those pieces be looked at. I think you'll see that Fred Burton is innocent. In this insider-exclusive Justice in America Network TV special, our news team visits with Jonathan Gettleman and Elizabeth Caballero, partners at Caballero and Gettleman Law Office in Santa Cruz, California, and Eleanor Childs, retired attorney, educator, and Frederick Burton's friend, as well as Carol Miniker, a juror on Mr. Burton's second trial. To go behind the headlines to see the challenges they've faced and the progress they are making to exonerate Frederick Burton after 48 years of wrongful incarceration. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Santa Cruz, California. My great pleasure to introduce two fine lawyers, Jonathan Gettleman and Elizabeth Caballero. Welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Tell our audience a little bit about your practice. What type of law do you practice? We have a dual practice. We have a civil rights firm where we represent people in both civil and criminal areas of the law, criminal defendants who have been charged with a crime, and civil plaintiff litigation uh, litigants who have been uh, aggrieved and so want to bring a claim against an employer or against the government for a wrong committed against them. Today we are here about a case that both of you have been involved with since I think 2002, 17 years. I know your dad was involved, he's a lawyer too, but he was involved with it prior to that. But you've lived with this case for a great majority of your life. And the case is about your client Frederick Burton Tell our audience a little bit about Jonathan. Uh, who is Frederick Burton? Frederick Burton is my godfather. I've known Frederick Burton since I've been born. When I was very young, uh, my parents used to take me to the prison in western Pennsylvania, which was just uh, outside of town on the Ohio River. And uh, I think at one point I was introduced to him as his future lawyer. Um, he is an incredible human being. He is an inspiration to the people around him because despite uh, many harsh labels that have been cast on him, he is a peaceful, wonderful human being. He has spent 11 years unjustly in solitary confinement as part of the 48 years that he has been consecutively in prison. And in that time, he has developed a very deep understanding of human nature and he is the core of all the people around him to remain peaceful and make it through this system that he has been ensnared in. Basically he was wrongfully convicted way back in 1972 or 3 was it? 1972 is his trial yes. So we are here today about the case that you represented him on for the last 20 years or so, almost 20 years, uh, where he was wrongfully convicted in 1972, is that right, of the murder of a Philadelphia police officer. A police officer was killed in Cobbs Creek Park in Philadelphia, and another police officer was shot in the face but did not die. And at the scene, there were four African-American individuals who were either had guns on them or were caught with guns. There was a bag with grenades in it beside one of them. One of those individuals whose name was Hugh Williams 
on the night of the murder, they went to his house and took his wife, who was about eight months pregnant. The police did. The police did. They took her down to the police station and they held her there for 16 hours. They took her children away from her and they did not let her talk to their attorney even though she asked for it and they tortured Hugh Williams. They literally handcuffed his leg to the floor and tortured him in a chair in the room right next to her and they eventually extracted a statement from her. And in the first statement, she named Hugh Williams' friends who the police suggested to her were involved in this. And actually, the friend, one of the friends was Frederick Burton, correct? Not on the first night of the murder, so that's important. Three days later, they brought her back, and it was that second police statement where she named Mr. Burton. And Frederick Burton, prior to this time, had never had any run-ins with the police, right? No. He was married, was he not? He was married. He was married, he had he, two kids. He had a son, and he had twins that his right. wife was expecting. He was right. a full-time employee for Bell Telephone. He was a high school graduate. He was, you know, very connected not only to his immediate family, but to his extended family. Um, he was just not a person that was going to go commit this sort of crime. So let's talk about what happened with Marie Williams, and we're showing on the screen um, the immunity hearings and the statement. Right. Tell our audience, explain what happened with her. Mr. Burton, as all criminal defendants, had a preliminary hearing. At the preliminary hearing, at the first two preliminary hearings, Marie Williams came and said, I'm pleading the fifth. I will not testify because I believe I could incriminate myself by testifying. I mean, they found grenades in her house. And her statement said that she knew that they were in her house. So they uh, said, the prosecution said, well, we want to stop the hearing because she's the witness that we need and we're going to give her immunity. And so she can't take the fifth anymore. Right. So then they had a process where they gave her immunity that Mr. Burton was not privy to, nor was his lawyer. And when she came back, having been granted immunity, she testified that she had no knowledge that Mr. Burton did this at all, was part of a conspiracy, was in these meetings in her home, which is, that's ultimately what she said uh, in her statement, that Mr. Burton was in these meetings in her home with these other gentlemen. So when she comes back from the immunity hearing, then she testifies that Mr. Burton didn't do it at all. Yeah. And so the way that they held the case for trial was that they had a police officer take the stand after she just said that he didn't do it and read her police statement into the record against her sworn testimony and that's how the case got held for trial. Basically, and the police chief at the time was Frank Rizzo, correct? correct? And Frank Rizzo, as a lot of people may or may not know, was a really tough cop, if you will, and he broke the law like J. Edgar Hoover to get his way, right? They wanted to see your client, Fred, Frederick Burton, charged and convicted of this crime, one way or another, right? Correct. So when Talk to us a little bit about the trot, what happened at the trial. He was convicted, correct? Right. So at the trial, Marie Williams came and in con contrary to her third preliminary hearing testimony, yeah. she testified at trial that Mr. Burton was part of these meetings in her house and that on one occasion, voices in her basement where Mr. Burton was present discussed blowing up a police station near 61st Street, which is not what happened. Mm -hmm. right, a police officer was shot in a park. It wasn't blowing up a police station. But anyways, um, they had a big problem. The prosecution had a big problem. And the problem was is that she had already testified under oath that he didn't do it. So they had this design to rehabilitate her testimony. In what does it mean, rehabilitate? Change it? To make her appear more credible than what would be indicated by the fact that she's an admitted perjurer. Yeah. So they were, they said, well, she had only lied on one occasion at the preliminary hearing, that she uh, did everything completely voluntary, nobody forced her to do anything, mm -hmm. that her police statement on the night of the incident was consistent with her trial testimony, and that the reason why she lied at the third preliminary hearing was because she believed her, she said that her attorney 
who also represented her husband, told her that if she um, testified against Frederick Burton, then that information could be used against her husband, and basically she could give her husband the death penalty. All of those four points of rehabilitation were completely untrue, and we can now prove that. Right. Um, talk to our audience a little bit about what a Brady violation is. Sure. A Brady violation is a violation of due process under the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. It has three elements. One is that the prosecution withholds evidence of an exculpatory nature, meaning it tends to show the person didn't do the crime. The second element is that it is favorable, that information is favorable to the defendant. And the third element is that it, the information is material to what happened at trial, meaning it isn't just some completely side issue. It goes to the core of why the individual was convicted. The first statement that was withheld was a letter that she wrote to the district attorney's office on October, in October of 1970, where she essentially said, you have forced me to testify against my will and that you force me to give false police statements yeah. and that my statements are not true and that none of these gentlemen did these acts that you made me say in my police report. Mm -hmm. She sent that letter to the district attorney the next month um, in response to the petition for immunity. Uh, she filed an answer under penalty of perjury where she listed all of these uh, facts that would tend to show that the police statements that were extracted from her were completely false, that they were authored by the police department, that she was held for 16 hours against her will, that she was in pain, that they used physical and mental duress and, in her words, punishment to extract these statements and that they also threatened her with physical violence to make her come to court to testify. And this was all before the trial. Yeah, and at the trial, what happened? At the trial, this information was never disclosed. And so the, the defense attorney did not have a fair opportunity to ask her questions about this clearly damning evidence in relationship to her relying on the police reports. Which would have uh, resulted in Frederick Burton not being convicted, right? Being acquitted. The, the, the amazing thing about this case is that there is no DNA evidence implicating Mr. Burton and there are no eyewitnesses saying that he was present at the scene. This case rests on the testimony of one witness, the wife of a co-defendant, who said he was present at one meeting or the discussion of a killing of a police officer. Okay, Frederick Burton was convicted. He was sentenced to? Life in prison. Life in prison. Um, talk to us about the Brady violation here. You, When did you get this information that Marie Williams was not disclosed at the court? When did you get the information that you are now have presented to the um, the district attorney, Larry Krasner? Is that right. Yeah. When did you get that information? So. When we graduated from law school, Mr. Burton was in solitary confinement for administrative reasons. Technically, he wouldn't cut his hair. Yeah. And that's what he was holding on to as his last bit of knowing that he was in control of his own body. So anyways, he was shuffled around to about 10 different facilities. He was kept in solitary confinement. And then as soon as he would have had to time out of it for not having done anything, Poorly, they'd put him in a new facility and it would start over. When we filed a 1983 lawsuit to have him removed from solitary confinement and have this process stop, he, his family got together about $2,000, $2,500 to get all of his court records. And in his court records, there were two documents that had never been in there before. One of them was this letter that I described for Marie Williams. The other one was the transcript of his immunity hearing. Neither of those documents had ever been filed, and so his file was lost for a long time. When it was all collated back together, these documents were in there. So that started the process in 2003. We went through the entire court system, state and federal, but the court found that he was time barred, so none of the merits of his case would be heard. 
and uh, that was tragic for us. So, so can we, you explain for our audience time bar? Sure. Um, there is, in the 90s, the crime bill was passed, and as part of that crime bill, there was an Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act. And that Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act instituted a one-year limit to get new information to the court. In Pennsylvania, the limit is 60 days. Mr. Burton received thousands of pages of documents. He did not find that within 60 days. And so they barred him from any consideration of any Pennsylvania court. And when we went to federal court, because the state process took years, the federal court said he was now barred in federal court because it took more than a year that you're allowed in federal court. So he was effectively kept out of any process to address this. So we fought and fought and we discovered that they still had a critical document, this uh, answer to the immunity petition signed under penalty of perjury that they would not give us. So when Larry Krasner came into office... And tell our audience a little bit about Larry Krasny, for example. He was a public defender for a while, correct? Mm -hmm. He'd been a civil rights attorney for 23 years or something mm -hmm. like that. He is the opposite of what a normal prosecutor is. Immediately when he came into office, he fired 30 assistant district attorneys. And he did because they weren't doing their job. They were more, more interested in getting notches on the gun uh, of conviction rather than making sure someone's innocent or not, okay? The petition that you have filed with his office was filed when? So we filed a petition back in March with his Conviction Integrity Unit, which March is... March of... 2018. Okay. With his Conviction Integrity Unit, because we knew that this document existed and they weren't giving it to us for a reason. Yes. But they had withheld it, they denied that they had it, and we said, all right, Larry, you know, we firmly believe in everything that you've done with your life to this point, and we believe in what you're doing with the Philadelphia's uh, District Attorney's Office, and we know this document exists in your files, and you should give it to us. There's no reason after 48 years to continue to withhold it. So you got it. So we got it. And then um, at that point, we filed our post-conviction petition um, with the Pennsylvania courts, and we are in a very good position now. The judge has denied the Commonwealth's motion to dismiss because of lack of jurisdiction. Again, for what reason, we don't know. Larry Krasner's office is still trying to hide behind this time bar so that Mr. Burton's case cannot be heard. But the judge denied their motion and has now set an evidentiary hearing after which he has the ability to release Mr. Burton from prison. So people can understand the Philadelphia DA's office is a big office like New York, like L.A. How many district attorneys, how many assistant district attorneys do they have in the Philadelphia office approximately? A lot. Hundreds. More than 100. Hundreds. More than 100. Between 1 and 200. So not every case... Is, 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 is submitted to Larry, the district attorney. He has people that look at these cases. He doesn't review every case, right? And that's one of the reasons why we're doing this show, so he can understand what exactly is going on with your client, Frederick Burton. It's correct? not clear if he's had any review of this case personally. Yeah. What is clear is that the only reason why we got this document in June 2018, the answer to the immunity petition, is because there was a regime change. There was a policy change in the office wherein the assistant district attorneys gave it to us. But again, like you said, it is not clear that Mr. Krasner himself has had the opportunity to review the case at all. Okay, so let's talk about the, the elephant in the room. And let me tell you what that is, okay? Uh, when Frederick Burton went to prison, uh, I think it was three years into his sentence, 1973, he happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yes. And that was in a warden's office. They were discussing the issue of making available to Muslims the ability to pray, correct? Yes. To correct. observe their religious freedom, correct? correct? And tell our audience what happened. Well, in order for me to tell the story, I have to start from where this starts. The Pennsylvania penal system at the time was a deeply racist institution, okay. as was the Philadelphia Police Department and the Philadelphia Prosecutor's Office. The establishment at the time was deeply racist. 
African American Muslims presented a very threatening posture to that establishment. They were getting rid of what they considered their slave names. They were challenging the system, often nonviolently, but challenging. Mm -hmm. What happened was that there were two fractions in the prison of Muslim inmates. There was the Nation of Islam Muslims, which essentially did the administration's bidding. They were their henchmen within the prison. And then there were Sunni Muslims who were just a religious sect of Islam. Mr. Burton was a Sunni Muslim. In order to punish Sunni Muslims, the warden took away their right to pray within their block unit. So they were not allowed to have their prayer rights. And for Muslims, praying five times a day is an absolute rock solid core of their religion. So two individuals from that group, the Sunni Muslims, went to the warden to talk to him about getting prayer rights reinstituted. One of them... And this was a prearranged meeting. Right. So this was a prearranged meeting. This was all set up. Joseph Bowen, who was the head of the Sunni Muslim group, was a bad person. I mean, he was a, he, he murdered people. And, uh, and Mr. Burton was a convicted now murderer. He never had any run-ins with the police, let alone convictions before, but now here he is, and this is his role that everyone has attributed to him. So there were two of them that went into the war. Because they never went anywhere by themselves. Yeah. And so Joseph Bowen said, you're going to come with me. And so he went. When they got to the warden's office, there are checkpoints within the prison. When you pass the visiting place, when you, you know, there are locks and you're searched. They were searched multiple times. When they got to the room where the warden was, the warden was, deputy warden was sitting at his desk, Fromhold is the name of the deputy warden. And he essentially said, I'm tired of all the, the trouble you're causing. He threw in some racial epithets and other words as well, but he basically said, I'm tired of all the trouble you're causing me around here, and this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take, and he, like, just like a teacher's desk, he had all these confiscated shivs in his desk. In his drawer. In his drawer, and he put, two of them on his desk and he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to plant these in your cells and then I'm going to send you over to the D block, which is essentially I'm going to transfer you to the Nation of Islam block. And just a week before, a person was transferred there and was stabbed 24 times and hung. So Joseph Bowen took that as a direct threat, a direct and immediate threat on his life. And that he is not the kind of person that you want to make that kind of threat to. And what he did was he picked up that shank and he stabbed the warden to death. And Mr. Burton, so there's interesting dichotomy because Joseph Bowen is all action, yeah. right? He gets in this pressure situation and he is versed. He stabs the warden, stabs kills the him. Warden. He also kills the assistant. Kills everyone that comes in the room. Yeah. He kills the, the, de the other deputy warden. Yeah. He kills a guard, the head of the guards. Your client totally didn't expect this. What is your client doing while these two murders are taking place? And, and also, he stabbed the captain, correct? Joseph Bowen stabbed the yeah, captain, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. But there were three law enforcement people in that, in that office besides Joseph and your client, Frederick Burton. Oh, and then there were others, yes. Yeah. So he stabbed three people, he killed two. I'm talking about Joseph Bowen. Right, and, and we brought Carol. What is Frederick Burton during, doing during this time? He is in a catatonic state of being completely overwhelmed by the stimulus that is coming in through his five senses. He is not uh, somebody who is accustomed to dealing with this kind of situation, to dealing with prison life. In prison, uh, Mr. Burton was the kind of person that when you came into the cafeteria, because he had clout from this this murder that happened in Philadelphia uh, with Von Kohn was seen as perhaps the inciting of an African-American literal revolution in the United States. And that's how it was billed at trial. So he has a lot of clout in prison, Mr. Burton, just from getting this rap, if you will. But the way that he used it was that like when people that he thought were vulnerable would come into the lunchroom, he would have them come sit by him. You know, he was inclusive. 
him and uh, another gentleman who was his cellmate literally stopped rape from happening in Holmesburg prison because they had a group of people who just did not accept that practice. Mm. It was used for political reasons to put people in line and make certain people act in certain ways, and he, they stopped that practice. They had an amount of force. Okay, wrong place at the wrong time. He's convicted. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, later on the show, we're going to have one of the jurors who I, who I think was on the second trial, Carol Miniker, I think her name is. She's going to be on the show. But getting back to the elephant in the room, district attorney's office, this is the message you want to obviously get out to them. You're looking at a file, if you don't know Frederick Burton, you're looking at a file with an inmate who's been convicted of basically three murders, right? Correct. Two all different incident, incidents, but three murders, correct? I, mm -hmm. And all law enforcement people. Right, right. Okay, so do you think this has been a problem in trying to get your case reviewed in the district attorney's office because they're saying, wait a minute, even if he was innocent the first time around, the second time he was convicted. This is a very, this is the most challenging part of the case is the perception that people have that Mr. Burton must be guilty. They have named the park by the Philadelphia Museum of Art you know where the rocky steps are, after Sergeant Von Kolm. He is a part of the city. This story, the way that it was told at the trial, is a part of the city. The prison is now named after the two wardens. Its name is of the two wardens who were killed. I cannot think of a more intensely hated individual for what was perceived to have been done by him and that overcoming that amount of political pressure on the district attorney's office itself yeah. is huge. I mean Larry Krasner's office is the one that gave us these documents and good for him for doing it but they immediately opposed us right. as soon as they gave it because they just, they just cannot acknowledge that this person may not have done these things. What do you want to see his office do right now? The right thing. Which is? And the right thing is to allow the judge to hear the merits of the case and allow Mr. Burton a process wherein all the evidence, not just some of the evidence, not just the bad evidence, but all of the evidence can be evaluated and Mr. Burton receive a fair hearing. That's what we want. On that first murder conviction. Correct, okay. because if he's resentenced and not found to be guilty of the first murder, then he has served his time for the second murder, irrespective of the fact that he is innocent of that murder as well. You're not contesting that. We are not contesting this at this time because he will have served his time okay. if the first murder conviction does not stand then he will have served his time on the second. What sentence did he get on the second conviction? He ultimately got a life sentence based on the fact that he had a prior murder conviction. Right. So if he does not have a prior murder conviction, then the maximum sentence for second degree murder, which is what he was charged with, murder without intent, yeah. um, is 20 years. Yeah. So he and will he have served that time, 48 years. Twice over. Yeah. Okay, so um, we have with us today um, two people who are very intimately connected to this story. Um, one of them is Eleanor Childs, who represented um, uh, Mr. Burton uh, for years and years and years. And another one, Carol Meneker, who was a juror on one of the trials in that second murder case. And we're going to bring them on right now. It is my great pleasure to introduce Eleanor Childs and Carol Meneker to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Tell our audience a little bit about your relationship, Eleanor, to Frederick Burton, please. I am, first of all, Jonathan's mother and um, uh, Fred's lawyer now. And I've known Fred for as long as I've known Jonathan. I was pregnant when we represented um, my husband, Paul Gettleman, and I represented the, well actually I was in law school and um, we represented the BAU-9, which is the Behavior Adjustment Unit. There were nine defend, uh, uh, plaintiffs in the case and they, um, we sued the prison and got 
rights for people in solitary confinement and closed the dungeon in Western Penitentiary. At that point, I got to know Fred very well because he spoke for the BAU 9, the Behavior Adjustment Unit 9, the whole. They're these nice acronyms, don't they? Yes, always. And anyway, um, I got to know him. He um, has a, Fred has a lovely, uh, shining personality. And um, uh, I took to him immediately and through the years have visited him in prisons all over the state and have, um, Jonathan is um, his godson. We made him his godfather. And um, through the years, as I, I did law, criminal law, for years, and then I became worried about the kids that I was representing and that they were speaking a different language than I was, like respect and courage and what did it mean to them. And so I was able to talk with Fred, someone from the black community who understood that culture as I began to develop a curriculum for teaching a universal language, a language of ethics. So Fred was really um, a powerful influence in that and I have always known him to be a, a, a sterling, sterling character. And I feel like I'm a good judge of character. I have seven children of my own. I have 16 grandchildren. I have many, many other children in my life. And, um, and I've been a very close, attentive friend to Fred for 43 years. And um, I feel like we are brothers. And um, we felt, Paul and I felt that uh, for years. And we were determined and are determined to get him out. Um, He's innocent. He's a he's fine man. He has all the qualities I would want in, in a child of mine. And I've never seen him lose hope. He's 73 years old now. 73. Yeah. I'm, uh, se I'm 75. And he's, he has always given me hope and people around him hope. He's, um, he's an inspiration. He's an inspiration. He's a true elder now. And the more these younger children get uh, warehoused into the prisons and they have nobody to guide them, nobody. He's very much looked upon as a wise elder in the prison and that has been his role this life and I think he knows that but I think it's about time that we let an innocent man out of prison. Mm -hmm. He is innocent. He's in there on two murder charges, innocent of both, wrong place at the wrong time. Okay, Carol. You served as a juror in Fred's second trial, yes. correct? Mm -hmm. Where he was accused of um, murder without premeditation of a warden, the prison warden, and the assistant warden, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and how did you vote at the time of the trial? How did you vote? in that trial? I voted to convict him of second degree murder. Okay, but today you are here mm -hmm. because you are telling America right now that you should not vote at that because you didn't have the information that you have available right now. Is that right? What is that information? Why have you changed your thinking? Um, sitting on that jury has never left my heart and soul. I was sequestered for three weeks. And that was in 1976? 1976. 1976. I was sequestered for three weeks. I was 24 years old. Um, I really didn't understand what was happening to me or what was happening in that courtroom. I'm not a wasn't stupid in that way, but I was very naive. And when I was selected for the jury, I will not forget the questions they asked me. They said, do you believe that, do you believe everything a police officer says? And I said, no. And they said, do you believe that this man is guilty because he's black? And I said, no. And at that moment, I feel like looking back on it, that I was a pawn in a system that was designed to not be fair. Okay, why, why do you say that? Because after being sequestered for three weeks, and I listened carefully to everything that was in the courtroom, but I had no history of any of this, and I sat 10 feet away from the other person who was convicted of the crime already, and it was a very intimidating situation for me. And all I wanted to do was go home. I'll admit that. I did not like being locked up in the Holiday Inn in Center City. 
I couldn't speak to anyone. I couldn't read what I wanted. I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't use the telephone. I could do nothing. And I often thought waiting there that they wanted me as a juror to know what it felt like to be in prison and to maybe even be so moved that you would kill someone. Um, but in any event, uh, when we heard two sides of the story in the hearing, in the trial, we heard the side of the story of a um, captain of the guards who was assaulted and survived, and we heard the side of a story from his co-defendant who was, to me, felt intimidating. This is Joseph Bowen? Well, they brought him in on a Saturday because they wanted to be sure there was no opportunity for anything to go south there. And he came up on the stand. I remember him very clearly. He was as far away from me as you are. And he had on an ill-fitting sports jacket and what were probably um, prison issue glasses that were, didn't really quite fit him right. And his attorney um, asked him, tell, said to him, tell the jury where you reside. And he said, in the hole. And he said, uh, he asked again, tell the jury where you reside. He said, in the hole. And then the attorney defined for us what the hole was because there was probably so, more than one. Right. So, and he proceeded to tell the story of what happened in that room. And he essentially said that he did everything. And he said that he stabbed the word that Fred, Fred was not. not guilty. Fred was not guilty. And Fred's when you guilty. first heard that, what, what did you think? Well, I processed it. But I also had to somehow weigh my sense of who this man was and whether what was in it for him to be saying what he said. Uh, he and Fred were friends, um, or at least acquaintances. I don't know if they were friends, but they were certainly acquaintances. And so I had a choice when all was said and done. Did I believe the captain of the guards? And what did the captain of the guards say? He said that he came into the room, he saw both men he saw Joe Bowen stabbing someone and saw a knife. And he claims that he saw Fred thrusting his hand at someone's back, but that he never saw a weapon. He didn't see the weapon, but he said he saw this. And, you know, one could, that wasn't what Joe Bowen said. Joe Bowen said Fred was doing absolutely nothing. Yeah. So those were the two stories that you heard there. So you voted to convict. Mm -hmm. That was in 1976. You're here today because why? Because for a long time I had a, an uneasy feeling. Every time jury duty would come up, I would panic. I'd get my jury duty notice and I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm not going there. Um, and I postponed a number and I sat a couple of times and got let go. But I kept thinking, why is this bugging me so much? And so I decided that rather than recall the sort of silly things that happened at the hotel with the jurors, I started to think about what really happened in that courtroom. And I went back and Temple University helped me find all the newspaper clippings from that time so that I could get a sense. I didn't ever read the paper then. I didn't live in Philadelphia when the crime took place. I had no background on this. So I learned what I could from the newspaper. And then as I did my internet search, I found Jonathan. And it took me a year to get the courage to call Jonathan and say, what is this about that you're trying to get him out on this first conviction? Yeah. And Jonathan was able to tell me what I never got in the courtroom. Which is? Which was Muhammad's truth about what happened in that room, which was that he was so shocked at what was taking place, it was so unexpected that he was frozen in his tracks and that he did exactly what Joe Bowen said he did. He never, he just stood there and watched. And um, Jonathan also told me what happened after that, the extent to which these two men were beaten and um, how Fred essentially tried to save Joe's life when he was near death from a beating and he threw himself on top of Joe in the warden's office. And they both ended up pretty seriously injured. And so I just started to think, to, and, I, and the, the big crux for me was, and I can tell you exactly why I voted the way I did. The judge said to us in his instructions, if, Mr. Burton was in the room when this happened. This is what I recall the judge saying. And I remember clearly sitting in the jury room and I thought, well, if that's the case, if what he said is true, well then, whether I like the law or not, and the judge was very clear on that too, it's not whether you agree with whether this is the right law, you just have to take the evidence that's in front of you. It's, Eleanor, it's almost like you're an attorney. It's almost like an accessory to murder. You're in the room, you're guilty. Is or that the deal? a conspiracy like they, they yeah. do that, but he, but he was. But where's the intent? I mean, he yeah. had no... Yeah, I don't, I don't think he had intent. Premeditation, nothing. I remember the first vote of the jury, and there were people who said that he was not guilty. And I thought, well, how can you say that if what the judge said is true? 
I remember thinking that way. It was clear to me at that time with what I knew and what I brought to this room, which was a very privileged white life. Does it state that in the transcript? Well, the we can't find the transcript. The transcripts are missing. Well, that's what I want to know, because I want to know for myself, did I hear what he said and did I make a choice based on that? But in any event, that's why I'm here, because I always thought, as Eleanor said, and I've said it many times, Fred Burton was in the wrong place at the wrong time okay. twice, mm -hmm. sadly. And if he hadn't been convicted of the first murder, he wouldn't have been in the wrong place the second time. So the message that both of you, and one at a time, want to send the current district attorney of Philadelphia, what is that message, Eleanor? You're holding an innocent man for almost 50 years. Review the case and let him out. Review the case. Just look at the piece of evidence that has been hidden. Yeah. My message is what I've seen, what Jonathan has shared with me, is that each time Fred tries to petition the court for this first conviction, the second conviction is brought up and says, wait a minute, you're not letting this guy go anywhere. He killed the two wardens. My message is, I don't think he killed the two wardens. So don't take that as separate the two. separate the two whatever you want to do with that is fine but don't make yeah. him guilty of crime a because you think he was guilty of crime b i want to thank both of you for being on the show and we're sending that message to the district attorney's office thank you i hope it works it has to work yes As we watch this show, the audience is wondering, and you hear this a lot, my civil rights were violated. What are civil rights? What's the definition legally of civil rights? Your civil rights are your constitutional rights that are guaranteed to each and every person, not just citizen, but person, to be treated equally under the law. It entitles you to due process. And due process is just a legal term for a fair hearing. And that's all we want at the end of the day is a fair process for each one of our litigants, especially, and most especially, Mr. Burton. And those of us that practice civil rights law recognize, and as does the Constitution, that civil rights are inalienable. You are, uh, born, with you are born with them. They are inherent in your humanity. They are not something that is just given by the state. They are recognized as such. And what we want for Mr. Burton is just one opportunity to present his case fairly because at the trial it was intentionally presented unfairly and that cannot withstand the, his constitutional rights. You know when someone comes to your office and they watch this show and they say hey uh, my civil rights were violated how do you evaluate a case? These cases this case has been going on for a long time and you both of you have been involved your entire careers so how do you evaluate whether you want to handle another civil rights case? Sure uh, you know it's a relationship and yeah. what you have to recognize is that when you fight for somebody's rights, when you advocate for them, you're taking on their life in a way, an aspect of their life where they have been aggrieved or harmed or injured. And so we try to evaluate it in the way that we do any relationship. Yeah. Is this person going to be able to work with us in a way that is going to effectuate a good result to their case. It's about justice. It's why you became lawyers. It's right? about our passion for yeah. advocacy. I want to thank both of you for being on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.